evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones. It's great to be back. Now, here to answer your questions tonight, Sky News International Editor and Indigenous Affairs Editor for The Guardian Australia, Stan Grant. Youth Educator and Australian of the Year Local Hero, Catherine Keenan. 2016 Australian of the Year, General David Morrison. Poet and finalist for Young South Australian of the Year, Manal Yunus and the head of emergency at St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney, the 2016 Senior Australian of the Year, Gordian Fulda. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. And I'm sorry to say that uh, Rosie Batty isn't well. She had to pull out of Q&A late today. We wish her a very speedy recovery. Well, Q&A is live to air on ABC TV and News 24 across Australia. So all Australians have the chance to join this national conversation. But a lot of great questions. Let's go to our first one. It's from Madeline Charles. Is it right that we continue to hold our national day on a day that marks the invasion of Australia? when we have so many better dates that can be celebrated in Australia. David Morrison, we'll start with you. Well, on, as part of my acceptance speech uh, to receive the award for Australian of the Year, I, I spoke, obviously, uh, you know, recognising the, the first people of Australia and said that for them, many of them, brothers, our brothers and sisters in the Indigenous community, tomorrow would be a day of emotional conflict. And without doubt, that is the case in 2016 as it has been for over 200 years. But this is going to surprise some in the audience. I don't feel qualified to answer. And it's not because, uh, you know, I, I have a particular view one way or the other. This is something that a government would have to decide. And the only way that a government would decide something as key as this is if there was probably either a point in an election that uh, a party differentiated itself from another party or if we went to something, well, like a plebiscite or a, a referendum. David, I, is there a, le a legitimate argument oh, for I considering think... a plebiscite or a referendum well, I on think this there's issue? A, I think there's a legitimate argument when you don't have uh, the national day of your country uh, being agreed to in terms of the date by all of the members of your country. I mean, uh, no one stops to call into question the 25th of uh, uh, April for Anzac Day. But Australia Day is something different. And, and that's why I don't feel qualified to talk about it. I mean, people might be, you know, is he, is he running shy of that? I, I'm not. It sounds like you sort of have an opinion on it, though. It sounds like you're suggesting that if there were a plebiscite, you'd favour that question being put on it. Oh, I think that there could potentially be, if uh, there was political will, a plebiscite, and then I think I would probably just at this stage say that I would want to listen to the arguments of all sides, Tony. Well, you might get a chance to do that on the panel. Now, we've just launched a Twitter poll too, so we have a small plebiscite ourselves, to see what you think about moving Australia Day to a different date. Check our Twitter account in the next five minutes to cast your vote on that question. Stan Grant, mm. what do you say? It's not an easy one to answer, to be honest. You know, I also work for National Indigenous Television and we hear from Indigenous people, particularly on that day, our people, my people, about how tough it is to come to terms with a celebration around what was an invasion of our land, the dispossession of our people, uh, and everything that has come from that, that people still live with every day. You said before, that there can be many other dates. Well, what other dates are there? Do we celebrate the Day of Federation? Well, we haven't even resolved the issues in our constitution yet. The race provisions in our constitution, the failure to recognise Indigenous people in our constitution. Do we, do we celebrate on Anzac Day? Well, that's only part of our story as well. I think if or when we become a republic, that will present itself as an obvious and natural day. But I just want to say this. For us, as Indigenous people, it's, it, there are many aspects to it. One is to mourn the invasion, to mourn dispossession and the consequences of it, to celebrate our survival, and that is not to be underestimated, the survival and the resilience of Indigenous people, our families. But for me as well, to acknowledge the fact that Australia is a remarkable country. And I've spent my life reporting from some of the worst hell holes on earth, and Australia is a remarkable country. 
Yeah. And we need to acknowledge that. And I don't want to diminish the right of Australians to acknowledge that day and to celebrate that day. But remember, the people on whom Australia's prosperity and success has been built, and that is often the suffering of Indigenous people. It so, is very so are problematic. You, are you suggesting the, the whole nation should effectively celebrate and at the same time mourn? Yeah, I, I really think it needs to be a much more inclusive day. Noel Pearson has spoken to this and he said, you're looking at a three-pronged celebration or commemoration. The original landing in Australia of the first peoples <coughs> more than 50, 60,000 years ago. The coming of Europeans, First Fleet, which was transformative. That is the bedrock of modern Australia. We can't deny that. And Knowles also pointed out the, the end of the white Australia policy, which helped give rise to the multicultural society that we have today. To be able to bring all of those elements together on a day where we celebrate, we commemorate, we are able to express ourselves, reflect on our identity, would give that day more meaning. But we are not there yet. Mm. Catherine Keenan, do you have a, a, a view on this one way or the other? Look, when I was in Canberra for the 26th of January this year, um, but the staff from the Sydney Story Factory were at the Yarbin Festival, which is a wonderful celebration of Indigenous culture for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people alike. And it's e exactly as you were saying, Grant. We were asking people, what does today <coughs> mean to you? And those questions are hugely... The, the answers to that question are hugely varied and mm. very often very sad and very mournful. Mm. And But also there's a resilience to it. So the question is, as you say, wh where to move it? I mean, ideally... I mean, in New Zealand, they have Waitangi Day, which um, celebrates the day that the treaty was signed between white people and the, and the Maori. And I know there's differences of opinion about that, but at least it represents a coming together of, of two peoples. And if we had a day like that, like the Republic... Well, that, that, that's country, also part of the, the growth and maturity of this country. And you've touched on something there, the Waitangi, the treaty between Pākehā and Māori. We've never had that in Australia yet. Mm -hmm. We have not signed a treaty. And we're the only Commonwealth country that has not manage to do that. So we don't have these, these moments in time that can act as a catalyst for the unity that we, that we seek. We don't, and, you know, as I said before, if we become or when we become a republic, that may present itself as a, a natural day to celebrate Australia Day. Gordian, what do you think? Well, I think it's been well said and the only thing I wish for is that we have a day where we all as Australians are Australians and we you know, eat, drink and dance together. Do symbolic days like this matter at all? I think it can be a bonding, right? I mean, I'll go there. I mean, some people can use it to get smashed, I suppose. But um, the reality is I think it's very important to bring the different groups together. Manal, what do you think? Well, personally, I don't feel comfortable celebrating Australia Day and that might be because um, I'm in, a, in Australia as a result of the destructive remnants of colonisation in um, the country that I'm originally from. So the idea... Eritrea, of, we should say that. Yes, in Eritrea. So I think that um, to celebrate the day that colonisation began and effectively racism in this country began um, is... It, it doesn't really sit quite well with me. So I do think that there might need to be a change in the day, but I... If there were to be, I think it's very important that the Indigenous owners of this land are at the forefront of that conversation and are the ones bringing it to the table and deciding how it's discussed as well. What do you think about the notion uh, that there should possibly be a plebiscite on this, a, a vote? We're obviously having one at some point on gay marriage. Mm. I think that there would need to be a lot of things done before that because, unfortunately, we're... Um, well, I guess there is good and bad in involving the entire nation um, in something like this, but also we've got to remember that there are very pe there are people who will be um, speaking who may not be that informed about it and who may just be participating. Um, so I think that perhaps we need to go through an education process because we know that there is a lack of education in regards to Indigenous issues, like whether, whether it is within our schools or within communities. So... I think that there'll be steps that need to be taken before something like a plebiscite. OK, uh, before we go to our next question, uh, let me give you the result of our poll. Uh, the question was, should Australia Day be shifted from the 26th of January to another day? And almost 200 votes were cast very quickly. 2,000, I beg your pardon. It's not a scientific vote, of course. But the result was 54%, uh, suggesting that it should be changed. Well, let's move on now. Our next question is a video question. It comes from Jessica Heath in Hornsby, New South Wales. This year, 
Three of the nominees for Australian of the Year were advocates for diversity. All three are white. What does it say about our country when we can listen to the message of white men, such as Australian of the Year David Morrison, champion diversity, when we can't take the message of Adam Goods with respect? Gordy, I'm going to start with you on that. Well, sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm just a mere emergency physician. I, I'm like... <laughs> Senior Australian of the Year. We, give, we give look me to a you as attack. a wise man. Give me a heart man. attack any time. I'll handle that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I defer to my learned colleagues over here. <laughs> so, look, the central argument of the question was that people are prepared to listen to white men speaking about diversity, but many people treated Adam Goods with disrespect. That's the central argument. Do you think that's true? Don't know enough about it, sorry. OK, Manal, what do you think? I think that that, that that is an issue that we have at the moment. Um, like, I, I mean, with all due respect um, to the Australian of the Year, well, when I think about um, movements for gender, gender equality and so on, there's, there is a lack of actual uh, of voices of people from those communities that are being given platforms to speak out when so many of the people or if not most of the actual action, the groundwork is done by people from these communities who are directly affected, whether that be LGBTQI or, um, or women or, um, or people from minority racial communities as well. So. Mm. Um, do you think it's a good thing that powerful white men like General uh, David Morrison, as he was, uh, end up as champions of diversity? I think that it's very important that, that they speak and they join the movement and they be a part of it and use their power for that. But I think that in terms of giving them the platforms when there is a possibility of that platform being used by somebody who doesn't have a voice, um, I think that that can be problematic. And I think that's something that we need to be very aware of. I, I mean, for example, I was speaking to Stan earlier and one of the reasons that his speech I found was so powerful was that it was an Aboriginal man speaking about those issues and too often do we have others speaking about them and we're more prepared to listen to them. I'll uh, go to Stan and uh, actually the speech that's being referred to um, did talk about what happened to Adam Goods very mm. passionately. Mm. Well, the, the Adam Goods issue for me, and I'm not going to sit here and, you know, Adam's been able to fight his own battles and, and very successfully. But the Adam Goods issue for me came down to this. I could not say what lay in the hearts and minds of people who booed Adam Goods. There may have been a whole range of reasons. What I could speak to and what I tried to speak to in the speech and in other things I've written is how we saw it, what we heard as Indigenous people. And as I explained, we heard a howl of humiliation and it echoes across 200 years of dispossession, injustice and suffering. And we live with the impact of that every day in our lives. I have, my parents have. The fact that I've managed to, to build a life for myself and have a measure of success doesn't diminish the fact that my family have been through enormous pain and trauma because of the impact of, of colonisation. The Adam Goods issue, though, really, for me, awakened the nation. And the response that I'd received to various things I've written or said has said that this country is reaching a point where they will engage with this. We won't all agree, but we're not shouting from the margins anymore. We're not, we're not speaking in protest anymore. We're speaking from the heart of the country as the first peoples of this country. And it is being heard and it's being received. And I don't think we've ever been there before in this country. And that, to me, has been a very positive outcome. Well, Stan, not everyone agreed, obviously. I mean, um, you might say the columnist Andrew Bolt was actually shouting from the margins, but he accused Adam Goods of using his soapbox to vilify our past and to preach division. I mean, that was his view. It was a view held by, let's say, a minority of people. What do you say to that? Well, you know, Andrew Bolt um, asks... often performs a useful function. This is a democracy. People have the right to express this opinion. This is not about censoring people's views. If people find issues of invasion and colonisation and settlement and dispossession confronting, then so be it. Let's have that discussion. Often I find Andrew will, will ask questions that, 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 that demand more thought from us. As Indigenous people, we need to engage with Australia as well and we need to find a way to have a dialogue. I don't 
I don't, you know, diminish or uh, negate the right of people like Andrew to, to raise those sorts of questions. Adam Goods was Australian of the Year. He was recognised not just for his work as a footballer, but for his work in recognition. He, he, he used that platform to advance issues of reconciliation, to challenge us. And yes, he paid a big price for it. But this is the democracy that we live in. And I don't think we're well served when people's voices are silenced. Equally, we're not well served when our voices as Indigenous people are silenced either. Catherine Keenan, I'll bring you to the, the core of the question, which started out by suggesting that um, it's, it's a sort of shame, I suppose the questioner was saying, that, uh, that white men um, are respected when they talk about equality, gender equality and diversity and those kind of things, but Adam Goods wasn't, mm. by at least a cross-section of the population. Yeah. Look, I mean, I think... I mean, David is not the only person speaking about equality, Absolutely. you know, yeah. and there were lots of other... Liz Broderick was a finalist and Kate McGregor was a finalist. There were lots of people speaking about equality who were involved in this argument. And David... David didn't ask to be the Australian of the Year, and he is, and he's doing a damn fine job of it and pushing the agendas forward that... You know, someone, Rosie Batty, has redefined what it means to be Australian of the Year and has done an extraordinary job. And I think the wonderful thing is that David is continuing to, continuing the work that she has begun, but in a, in a different way and from a different, different place. And I think that's a very valuable contribution. I mean, I think what happened to Adam, you know, I mean, you, you're right, Stan, everyone has a right to it, but Adam had the right to do what he did. No, he Adam had an absolute did. right to do his, um, you know, to celebrate his culture. And I think it was... It, that, that is something that we should celebrate. All of us should celebrate when yeah. someone can be proud yeah. like that. Absolutely. And I do, I, you know, I do. I think it was, as you say, a kind of a real moment of showing how uncomfortable we can be in Australia with that kind of cultural pride. David, let me bring you in because you've sort of owned up to uh, coming from a, a background of prosperous middle class white yeah. Australia and oh, all of that stuff. I mean, what, how do you respond to that question? Well, I think it was a fantastic question. The one that Jessica asked went, you know, to the heart of so many of the, the issues around diversity, particularly as it pertains to gender at the moment in Australia. And I think Manal uh, answered it really well as well, as, as did Stan and Catherine. My view here is that you can talk about diversity, but we should actually look at why we do that. I mean, if diversity is simply just checking some boxes that you've got this person of a particular gender or this person of a particular sexual orientation, well, that really just is a slither of what we should be looking at when we talk about true diversity. Diversity is about encouraging diversity of thinking just what Stan was talking about. Conversations in the country, conversations in a workplace, conversations in a family that we haven't had in this country uh, to a great extent before. Now, I think that Australian society is yet at something of a tipping point at the moment when it comes to the true nature of diversity. I think that we've got a conversation that is now a national conversation, and I think it just helps define us as contemporary Australians very powerfully and exceptionally uh, favourably. The point that I've arrived at in my journey, albeit from a privileged start, but now seeing issues that I'd never seen before and hearing voices that I hadn't heard before, is that a more diverse workforce is a more capable workforce. And so men and women get an equal chance to contribute. Men and women of different racial heritage or different sexual orientation or different religious creed get an equal chance to contribute. And if they do, we're all going to benefit. We shouldn't be closing anybody off. Why? But There's you, so you, much on can offer. Can I just say, one of the things I think we need to remember, and just bearing... Uh, David won't say this because he's, he's far too modest, but the, the criticism that David has received in recent days. I just want to speak to that. If you remember David's speech on the, the night that he was awarded the Australian of the Year, one word was key to me. He said, we need to listen to each other respectfully and we need to have a respectful conversation. But I would argue that in recent times, whether it's the proliferation of social media and the way that that generates so much heat and that spills over into the mainstream media, that there has been a lack of respect that's, built, that's what we saw with the Adam Goods issue. That's what we saw with Rosie Batty being criticised as well. And that's what we've seen with David's criticism. Right, so and, Stan, and we've got a question on this, so yeah. I'm going to go to it and we'll come back to you um, to help respond to that. The next question is from Tashinga Masinga-Rabwe. My question is to David Morrison. 
The woman who wrote the majority of your speech, which catapulted you into the position of Australian of the Year, Kate McGregor, was also nominated for Australian of the Year. So too was the woman who conducted a two large systemic reviews into defense abuse claims, Elizabeth Broderick. My question is, can we envision a proper future in which women are rewarded for the tireless work they undertake, whilst men aren't given credit for simply saying the right thing? Mm. Well, look, I, I think that that's a, an excellent question, and I can answer very genuinely and exceptionally honestly in that I was the most surprised person probably on the planet when my name was read out, and I mean that. I didn't think that I would be Australian of the Year, and I can tell you that my year was mapped out in 2016 on the grand assumption that I wouldn't be. You talk about Kate McGregor or uh, Elizabeth Broderick or uh, all of the other state and territory finalists, Australia would have been exceptionally well served with whoever was chosen. And I think your point is very reasonable as well. I've become something of a, a, a notorious figure for being a white Anglo-Saxon heterosexual male from a privileged background who talks about these things now. I'm not the only voice in Australia with the same sort of gender or ethnic makeup. I've just been paid attention to. I would say though, that I do think I see these issues clearly. And I do think I've had the chance, not with YouTube clip speeches, but with other things, to actually articulate a particular opportunity for Australia to harvest if we can. Now, I'm, I'm going to, just to picking up on, uh, well, actually, the question's got his hand up, so I'll go back to you. Go ahead. Um, my point is that, you know, what you said was simply what was expected of you as Chief of the Army at oh, the time. Yeah, I agree. Whereas, you know, women are doing countless, yep. tireless, unpaid sometimes work, you know, at the coalface and on the ground, and yet they're never properly rewarded for that work. I'm, okay. gonna, I'm just going to jump to his defence. Um, no, no, you don't need to. Okay. No, 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 I need no. to. I agree with you 100%. <laughs> I, I agree with you. I'm sitting here now as the 2000 Australian of the Year. I feel I don't know how it's arrived. Uh, you know, I'm going to take whatever opportunities I have, but you are 100% correct. Uh, but uh, the point I was going to make is that no other senior member of the Australian military, let alone head of the army, had ever said anything like oh, what you said. I don't agree with said. that, Tony. I, you know, in you, public. No, you, otherwise it wouldn't no, have caused such a storm. That is not true. I mean, David Hurley is the CDF said exactly the same things. In fact, I pinched his best line. Oh, here we go. I'm only telling you and I don't want you to repeat it. But the standard you walk past is the standard you accept doesn't belong to me or indeed to Kate McGregor. It actually belongs to the former CDF, the Governor of New South Wales. David, I hope you're watching. Um, <laughs> no doubt Catherine McGregor is watching as well. And look, she did post an unconditional apology on Twitter. She said she'd exercise poor judgment yeah. in criticising your appointment. Did you sort of accept that oh, apology? Oh, of course. Yeah, look, you know, when I was asked the question that afternoon and I said uh, three things, Tony. Firstly, the point that uh, a middle-aged Anglo-Saxon heterosexual male needs to understand more about the LGBTI community is an absolute given, and I will do that. I am certainly engaging with uh, people I already know and people I want to meet to understand the issues. Secondly, I noted that uh, Catherine had made an unconditional policy, uh, apology, rather, and the third thing I said was that I wouldn't make any further comment. Fair enough. Uh, Stan, however, I cut you off. Um, you were... No, no I, I, I was just going to say, it is one thing to engage with people and to criticise people and to have this conversation, but when I read people denigrating General Morrison's service and his family's service, casting aspersions on where his priorities lie while people were fighting wars in Afghanistan and the army that he was overseeing, I think that crosses a line and that is not acceptable. There are many things that if people want to disagree with David on the issue of the Republic, if there was an Australian of the Year who wanted to advocate the monarchy, great, all to the good, and we can disagree. But when you see people calling into question the service of someone and a family's tradition of service, that's just not on. Stan, it's wonderful for you to say that and, uh, you know, there has been a degree of churn in, in the media and, and in social media over that very point. Can I... Uh, let me give you a perspective. Tonight, as we are taking part in this program, there are 30,000 women, that's more women than all of the soldiers in the regular Australian Army, 
who are sleeping rough on the streets of Australia. There are another 100,000 men who are sleeping rough. There are thousands and thousands of women and children and men who are the victims of domestic violence. There are probably millions of women and men who are held back from their potential for very questionable criteria, which I spoke about in my acceptance speech. Compared to them, what is happening to me is of absolutely no significance. We, are, we all know that we need to focus on the big issues here, that we can, we are a great country, but we can be better. What's wrong with saying it? Nothing, because that's the only way we're going to get better if we are all start talking about it. OK, you're watching a special Australians Thanks, of the Year sure. edition of Q&A. Our next question is a video. It's from Peter Vincent in Wagga Wagga, New South Wales. It's been suggested that Wagga Wagga Citizen of the Year, Joe Williams, return the award because he failed to show respect and manners by choosing to remain seated during the playing of the national anthem. Should respect and manners be held above an individual's principles? And have you ever felt such a conflict? Manal, can I bring you in on that one first, since you obviously had a strong view about the, uh, the Australia Day to start with? Yeah, I think that... Um... <clears throat> I think that it, particularly in uh, in that case that the the lady was talking about, definitely principles need to come first in that case. I mean, standing up for a national anthem, we need to ask about who he's really offending in that situation. Um, the way that he was speaking, I saw the interview with him. It was it it was with respect. He didn't mean to to cause any kind of controversy. He was simply not standing for the national anthem on that day. And I think had I been in that position. I would have done the same thing because it would go against what I've done. Stan, I'm going to bring you back in can, can, uh, again. Yeah, I, I, I want to hear I from everyone. Need, those I do need a disclaimer. Joe is my cousin, our grandmother's sisters, and I am extraordinarily proud of what Joe does in that community. The work that he does for young kids who are suffering depression, who are battling suicide. In Indigenous communities, we are three times more likely to suffer depression and almost four times more likely to commit suicide. The work that he does is extraordinary. Shame is that it's often been overlooked with what we've seen here. Now, we saw incidents of flag burning on Australia Day as well, and that's an indication of the roiling anger that can still exist in Indigenous communities. And in this country, as a democracy, we have a right to express that. You also have a right to vigorously um, reject that and oppose that, and that's, and that's fine. And Joe decided on that day not to stand for that anthem, but he decided that he would accept the award and he would use that day to, to be able to speak to the work that he does. Stan, have you ever felt this conflict that the questioner asked I, about between it... respect and manners and your own principles? I, 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 you know, I'm a pretty respectful guy, to be honest with you, I think, and I'm a pretty well-mannered um, person. It was the way I was brought up. But when I was a boy, young, back in the 60s, um, going to school, uh, we had to stand each day for the anthem and we had to pledge allegiance to the flag and honour our God and salute the, the flag and, and, and all the rest of it. And I felt, even at the age of five or six, incredibly conflicted by that because I would go home and I would see where the flag had deposited us, where the anthem had deposited us. And when you look at the anthem, and I mentioned this in my, in my speech, um, the anthem begins, Australians all let us rejoice, for we are young and free. Well, we are not a young country. We are 60,000 years old. And while our people, my people, are 3% of the population and 27% of our prison population, there is a really strong argument as well that we are not free. And how do we rejoice around that? These are in areas of incredible conflict. Well, particularly I've, when I've those, those prison myself. figures you talked about, when you actually translate them into young Indigenous people, it's they're even worse. It's double. So, you know, these are very confronting issues. But I, you know, I must come back to this point, and that is that it is not beyond us to be able to deal with this. People often say, what is the answer? And my answer is to open the window and have a look outside. <laughs> you don't create a, a country as remarkable mm -hmm. as Australia mm -hmm unless you are a great people and you are a great nation. Yeah. So you are held to account for that greatness. <laughs> and we are three, fewer than 3% of the population. And we are still dying 10 years younger than the rest of Australia. That's not acceptable. And it is not acceptable in a country that 
is by any measure a great country. Catherine, um, let's go back to this uh, respect and manners versus principle. Mm. Have you ever found yourself in a position where they've been in conflict with you? <laughs> Look, I, I, I've been lucky. You know, they, they, they have not so much in my life. No, I mean, I know it is an, it is an, it is an issue for um, a lot of the young people that we work with. They feel similar sort of conflicts and things. But the point is that you can disagree with anyone if you're respectful. And I think that's, that's the that's the thing that we should cherish in this is, is if everyone is res if people are respectful then they can say what they like. Gordian, what do you think? I've got it really easy hmm. because in health we don't have labels. Somebody comes in, they're a you know, 42 year old male having chest pain or an 88 year old lady that's fallen over in a nursing home. So we don't label. So we're very lucky to them, to us, to them, they're a human being in need. And that makes my job very easy. We really, it doesn't even come up in the words that this is something or somebody or this or that. It's a human being and we have a basic descriptor of gender and age and then what they present, it got hit by a bus or whatever. So you're saying the practicality of your life, simply caring for people overrides those kind of considerations. Well, you don't have time to think about it? Don't want to think about it, but no, it's, it just doesn't come in because in the end, doesn't matter what colour you are or what religion you are, if you cut yourself shaving, you bleed. <laughs> David, I just want to hear you on, uh, on that question because obviously you've been a creature of the military. Uh, where creature. obviously. Oh, that's a very hard <laughs> <laughs> Okay, from a young man to an older man, you've okay. been a military man, let's mm. put it that way. And obviously the whole culture there is following orders whether you agree with them or not. Have you ever found yourself in a position where you've wanted to put your principle above those orders? Uh, oh, there, there were a few uh, moments where I disagreed with an order and I, in every case I discussed it with the person who had given it to me and uh, convinced them that um, there were good reasons for not following through on that. Now, they weren't life or death matters. Uh, but they were memorable. Um, you know, the question of manners, man we all function with manners and manners change over from, from generation to generation. I think Catherine's gone to the, the very heart of it, though. Why do we have manners? How, what, what governs our interaction uh, between human beings? If it's, if it's based on respect, uh, then you can start any conversation, and you can conclude it as well with respect. Now, I didn't know the circumstances of the question. It, it, it had... The Joe, the Joe Williams no, story. No, I didn't. And fair if, enough for him not to stand up for well, the national anthem had, under if, the circumstances? If I had been asked that question first without knowing it, and, and I decided to try and, you know, cuff it in front of an entire uh, audience, uh, my immediate reaction would have been, well, that sounds, that sounds disrespectful. But now I've just listened... I've just listened to the answers of my fellow panellists. I've listened to them. And I haven't just respected them. I'm now thinking, well, my original frame of reference here was not broad enough. And I don't have an answer for the person who asked, asked the question. And I'm going to conclude, I guess, in that respect, weakly. But the matter is not as cut and dried as it appeared in my mind when I heard the question being asked. Now, that's a good thing. That's why we came to you at the end. Um, now, <laughs> this year on Q&A, we'll be making the point of featuring unexpected questions to reset the agenda. Tonight, the question comes from Stephen Donoghue. With Mitchell Pearce, we have another incident of the sports star. Might just get you to start again there. We didn't have the microphone. They had a bit of a problem with our microphone, so go ahead. Uh, with Mitchell Pearce, we have another incident of a sports star behaving badly uh, with what seems to be copious amounts of alcohol involved. I'm wondering if we can put the finger on exactly what's here. Is it just an issue with alcohol? Is it a situation where people think they're above the law and common decency? Or is there something else going on? Gordian, um, this is certainly an area of expertise for you since you see the seedier side of King's Cross life so regularly. It's an incredibly concept. The simple answer is it's a very, very complex. It's cultural, individual, you could argue, privacy, all sorts of things. And we really have the need, as it's going to be a generational change, where I put straight there, we have people who have got a responsibility 
people know everybody's got a, a camera, there's no privacy and things. And really these are role models, it's the worst bit, these are role models for young people, right? And this is sort of a blessing by sportsmen or something and actors and all this thing to do really stupid judgment, uh, excess alcohol, drugs. They don't get into trouble. They get seen as heroes. And the media, I'm sorry, is part of that. Right? Uh, somebody misbehaves somewhere in a Hollywood uh, award ceremony or something, that'll come all over the place. So, but I think what we have to do as individuals and as a community, we have to say, we don't look this, we don't want this anymore. And we want our sports stars and everything to be true role models. And that goes for non-sport people. And it's just not acceptable behaviour to do. Uh, did, you, did you see the Mitchell Pearce thing as uh, symptomatic of uh, the problems with addiction? Um, he's gone off, obviously, to have treatment um, for that. Or did you see it as a broader cultural problem being played out? Well, I'll be simplistic. Uh, alcohol is very much of the male bonding in male adversarial sports, right? and football's always been there. Uh, and if one wants to go, one goes to the uh, sports stadium, there's, alcohol's a legal drug, but there's a lot of advertising and there are a lot of young people there. And then you even see bits on you know, test captains' uh, uniforms. I think we've got a problem. Manal, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think that it's such a huge part of, um, of social life in Australian culture. And I, I personally think that finding, um, I guess, other spaces that people can go to, because if you are out late at night, pretty much the only places you can go to that are open are, are bars. Well, that's the case in Adelaide. I don't know about ever, the bigger cities. But, yeah, I think that uh, for me personally, I'm trying to cre create spaces where you can go to and you don't have to drink. Because for me personally, I don't drink. I've never drunk. Can I try to stay away from that scene? So, but looking at that culture in mm -hmm. front of you, mm -hmm. um, as you said, well, the Mitchell Pierce, uh, the Mitchell Pearson is a sort of classic example in one respect. What do you think? What do you think about that culture? I think it can be quite destructive. Um, and I think that it's something that we do need to combat. Whether laws are the way to do it, I can't answer that. But I do think that, um, you know, whether it's through broader education or simply just changing what we glorify, because a big part of it is that we think that that's how to be friendly, is have a beer with someone and so on. And, um, yeah, I think that we need to kind of change our perspective on that because we can see the, the bad that it actually can do. Catherine, what do you think? Gosh, I think that anyone who knows me will roll their eyes if I answer a question about sport. But um, <laughs> I... It went beyond the, sport. <laughs> what about alcohol consumption? Look, the thing, the thing that saddens me about that is that uh, as a sporting role model, as you say, these people are celebrated, why was the person who was booed on the field Adam Goods, who's such a fantastic role model for young people and such a fantastic sportsman? And I just... I do find it sad that people are idolised and then you have these people who are truly sort of great role models who don't get the same respect. Stan. I think with the Mitchell Pearce story, it's symptomatic of something much bigger in professional sport. Here's someone who came into the, the professional ranks at a, quite a young age, 16 or 17. He's been brought up in that culture. Uh, the culture, as Gordian reinforced there, is, is one of male bonding and alcohol lies at the centre of that. And you are playing a sport that is funded by alcohol and alcohol ads and gambling and gambling ads and then young players are vilified for acting out the very things that their sport is founded in so you know there is an incredible amount think, of uh, hypocrisy. Well, rugby league i think to be fair probably wouldn't argue that it's founded on abuse of women and peeing on uh, couches no 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 it wouldn't <laughs> but that that tony as you know comes from the society the culture that they're brought up in the male culture, which people are rewarded for. Indeed, Mitchell Pearce had been in trouble before and had been rewarded with the captaincy and senior representative selection, despite clearly having demonstrated issues with this before. And I think it's something that lies at the heart of the culture of the game that we continually see this, and with the highest, often the highest profile players. There are many, many rugby league players and, uh, who are doing extraordinary things, extraordinary things in the community. We never hear about them. But when you have a culture that is often built around this, then you vilify someone who finds himself in a situation where he is acting out the culture that he's been immersed in. David, uh, he was a leader of his 
football team, but uh, at a broader level, is there a leadership problem uh, with these sports? Gee, I, look, the, the, the way the, questions have been, the question has been answered, I, I've got really, Tony, little to add. I, I mean, it does go to the heart of uh, not just role models, but how we respond to role models. So we all, in the end, are the masters of our masters or mistresses of our own fate, and we can all choose to take a particular path in life, or you know whether we stay on it or correct ourselves. We all have to have a, a level of personal responsibility, and of course, if you uh, you can you can come very seriously unstuck now with social media if you don't. Uh, live to uh, you know a, a particular standard, and it's hard to ignore the fact that you've walked past it. If you <laughs> if you uh, if you're caught, I, I don't have anything to add. Uh, I think Gordian really went to the heart of this. Mm. Okay, well we can move on. There's another side to the issues that Gordian's been dealing with. The question from uh, Tom Nikolovsky goes to some of that. Go ahead. Good evening, panel. How can Sydney see itself as an international hub? when the shops close at 5.30, food can't be served past midnight, and lockout laws mean that you can't get a drink past 1.30. Do we not see that nanny state laws are to the detriment of Australia and the fun that can be had here? Gordian. Too easy. First of all... <laughs> <laughs> we, should, we should remind those who don't know you throughout the rest of the country wouldn't realise you're probably one of the strongest advocates for the uh, pub lockout laws. Well, yeah. First of all, I'd just like to add from the thing if I wanted one thing to go into the drinking water throughout Australia, it would be, and that's for young children especially, and things, actions have consequences. Right? It's all very nice saying responsibility. Basically, you make this decision, well, this, you've got to know what's happening. Now, with the nanny state thing, it actually, sorry to be uh, whatever, but no, nobody's stopping anybody drinking at 1.30. You can go home, 60% of people who get in trouble bought their alcohol in liquor outlets. In other words, not in hotels and pubs and all that sort of stuff. So one, it's not saying you can't drink. You can drink at 4 o'clock in the morning. Go home and have a bottle of champagne, whatever, between some friends. But the thing is... <laughs> 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 but so I mean, it's got to be. Can I just say um, that, that, that might be the response of a, of, a, <laughs> of a middle class white surgeon. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm just saying, there are an awful lot of people who just want to have a bit of a drink late at night, out what? where they are, and they can't go to the pub after a certain time. Well, whatever. But uh, all the lockout law, and, and really, all these things are not just one thing. I hate the expression of lockout law because it's a raft of things, and it came from Newcastle. A lot of it, but each. Society, each city, each especially rural towns and things like that have to work out, A, as individuals, there is a problem and they want to do something about it and then work out together, like in Newcastle with the hoteliers and all that, saying, uh, mutual, let's try this because we're sick of having our young people in fights, all that sort of stuff, all this trouble, drink driving, whatever, jobs lost. Anyway, not a good look and basically it's come from the grassroots and then it'll do good. Um, Tom's got his hand up. I'll go back to the questioner. Go yeah, ahead. Do you not see how that ruins Sydney nightlife, though, and, like, tourism that comes here and the people that want to come to this country? Like, why would an 18-year-old want to go out in, in Sydney when they could go overseas and not have to deal with any of these nanny state laws? You, you're not going to like me, but that's all right. I've got a dog. Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, so did Mitchell Pearce. That didn't help. <laughs> But the, you can go to the casino, right? That's kind of thing. There's places that have got licences. I'm just saying what, to me, the, in the party precinct that my emergency department drains is we, I think there's less violent, out-of-control people on the footpath. So if you're a girl, boy, walking along, you're no longer in danger of getting really in a trouble where you, there's this group of out-of-control people coming along. Gordon, have you, have you seen evidence of that? I mean, direct evidence? Are you able to quantify it in some way? Oh, yes. I mean, it's published in the MJA. Yes, I'm the author. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, the thing is, yeah, we saw 25% decrease over the weekend of the really serious injuries due to alcohol. That's the people who got hit, the people who uh, tried to cross the road when they're drunk, all these things, people who did dumb things like climb high walls and fell off. Really astounding 
how much benefit there was to the, stop these serious injuries. Oh, Tom, you've got to go back to Tom quickly. Do you, do you think maybe, in yeah. fact, you're safer now? No, no, I was going to say, shouldn't it be our decision to put ourselves in dangerous situations like that? I mean, if you don't want to do that, you can just not go out that night. Let me, let me throw that to our other panelists. Catherine, what do you think? Uh, do you, are you worried about this nanny state notion that Tom has uh, exercised about? No, look, it's always your own decision if you want to fall off a wall, I suppose. But, <laughs> you know, if you... If you you know, if you run in front of a car and get run over and, you know, it traumatises the other person, if you hurt someone else, if you punch someone else, you know, like it's... I, I, I think as Gideon's... As, um, sorry, Gordian says. Um, the benefits are kind of obvious, I think, and they've really kind of helped. I, I used to live in that area. I know people who still live in the area. It's much nicer to walk around um, yourself and, you know, with young children, you feel safer. I've got to cut in there. Sorry. It's not all about you, the individual. The cost to the system, the hospitals, the ambulance, the police, the loss of income, the, all that sort of thing, and a lifetime of brain injury care. It's not just about a single decision. Aren't we lucky we don't have guns like America? Yeah, it really is. Stan, I'll bring you in. Mate, I'm... I'm tucked up in bed at 10.30 at this stage of my life <laughs> with a book. Um, the nanny state's fine by me. Uh, yeah, David, nanny state. No, I'm just playing straight man to Gordian tonight. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to move on. The next question is from Ronaldo Aquino. Yes, hi. Um, just over a week ago, Mark Latham alleged that the domestic violence figures are actually on the decline, and he was chastised for it in social media. And I checked the Australian Institute of Criminology, and he was actually right. Um, the figures actually peaked around 2007. So is this a case of the squeaky wheel gets the grease? David Morrison. Uh, you know, in my a hometown of Canberra in the Australian Capital Territory, there is an organisation called the Domestic Violence Crisis Service. It's burnt through its annual budget halfway through this year. You talk to... Uh, extraordinary men like Ken Lay down in Victoria, and he'll tell you something completely different. It's not about the statistics, it's about the lives that are being uh, taken and damaged here. And what do you want to do? You want to compare a particular figure from a year to a year? We are, as a society, becoming more aware of that the, the, I think the greatest social challenge that we face, and that is domestic violence in this country. And nothing should be said to take our attention from it. Now, I'm, I'm meeting with uh, Michael Costigan fairly soon. Tara Costigan was killed in the most brutal fashion uh, in the ACT. You can't look at the Costigan family and quote a statistic, oh, it's in decline and it's a squeaky wheel. Get real, Australia. We run the risk at times of being a nation of bystanders, comforted by a few statistics. Let me tell you, there are people dying and people whose lives are absolutely ruined as a result of domestic violence. And what's more, we are all, as a society, the victim. That's bullshit. Just on the um, question of statistics, it might be... Um... <laughs> Sorry, you're on your program, Tony. That's all right. It might be a job for our fact-checking unit on the mm. issue of the statistics. We actually looked at um, the ones you're talking about and they stop at 2012. Um, but then if you look at the f figures that come later, it rises again up to 2015. So but there is a problem with these statistics. So I think everyone needs to get a grip on them. We'd like our fact-checking unit to uh, have a look at that. But um, go sorry, ahead. Sorry, we are more aware. There are more instances of domestic violence now being reported. Uh, this morning, I, I had the privilege of opening the, the legal year in the ACT, and I was talking to some of the lawyers down there, and they were just saying, look, we are now... What the, Community expectations are, and very appropriately, that we deal with instances of domestic violence in a much more immediate way. And, of course, it's not just the courts, it's first responders like police, it's the, the community organisations like the Domestic Violence Crisis Service in the ACT, but they are all stretched. There is now a demand out there. Women... Children, men too, are putting their hands up and saying, I can no longer live this way. Of course, there are many more women 
and, and children who are, you know, the victims for the next generation and perhaps the generation after that. We are all stretched to deal with this, but if we don't deal with it, what is the legacy we leave for those who follow us? Catherine. Look, I think David's put it very eloquently. I mean, there's no level that's OK, you know? Even if it has gone down, it's still not OK. It's still something we have to argue about. There are women dying every day, you know? It's still something that we have to, we have to as a society, address. Tony. Can yeah, I just put in, in there? Yeah, putting can. my professorial hat on, um, is that all these things are very soft, the statistics. The sad reality, the number of patients that come to emergency departments who are offered, we're getting better at it and things, who are offered counselling, offered all this thing, still they say no. They don't even want the police involved. We, it really is so, so large. We really don't know what the statistics are, but it's big. I'm going to uh, break in there. Remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, send a tweet using the hashtags FactCheck and Quanda. And keep an eye on our Twitter account for Fact Checks by the Conversation and the ABC Fact Checking Unit. Well, our next question comes from Colin Middleton. I found Mr Morrison's acceptance speech divisive. It has angered that portion of the population who are constitutional monarchists and do not want a change to a republic. Isn't this unusual for someone newly appointed as Australian of the Year? Well, Colin, you know, I accept your point to a degree, but I did uh, say very clearly, and I, I hope specifically, uh, that I was raising this point because I am a, a Republican, but I do so deeply conscious and also deeply respectful that there are many Australians who have a different view. I just think that 16 years after the last referendum, it is time to have another conversation about it. In saying that, I agree entirely with the Prime Minister. This will be, you know, the timing will be decided by whoever is the government. And that I leave to him. Were you surprised um, to see Malcolm Turnbull come no, out straight not away and knock it on the head? No, so no. Quickly? He's got to deal with the political aspects of this, but he did also say that this can't be politician led, that it has to be from the grassroots. And I can't see how it could be from the grassroots unless it started with a conversation. If no one wants to have the conversation, Colin, and absolutely respecting your view, I'm not going to have a soliloquy as a result. Um, do you intend to use your bully pulpit as Australian of the Year to no. keep pushing that idea? <laughs> no, no, my no. bully pulpit. Yeah. Uh, well, you've no. got one, obviously. No, I don't have a bully pulpit. I mean, I don't think that the Australian of the Year uh, has some sort of given right to express a view, uh, you know, irregardless of other people's views, and I would never do that. I, I absolutely accept the point you've just made, Colin. My father who I love deeply, my mother, who I love deeply, they were both constitutional monarchs. But my father's brother, Barry, convinced me in 1971 that a republic was the way to go. And one of the proudest moments of his life, although it was a short-lived one, was voting for a change in 1999. Now, he died a number of years ago. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, we, need, we all need to have a look at what Barry Morrison had to say, but. I've been with this for a very long time and it's absolutely rooted in respect for other people's views. We all live in the one country. Manal Yunus, um, I'll go to you because you mentioned at the beginning having come from a country that was colonised, um, you found it hard to accept uh, Australia as being in a way celebrating uh, the moment it became a colony. Um, what about the Republic? Well, I think we'd have to look at... Um when we're having the discussion about Australia becoming a republic, we have to look at what, what will that actually mean for the everyday Australian. I can say that with the communities that I work with, the main concern would be that if we were to become a republic, would this change the way that we treat our Indigenous population? Because it will be a change in our identity. And uh, will, will this affect the way that we treat our other minority communities, whether it be Muslims, whether it be other, other cultural or racial groups? And if it doesn't, then... Um, I personally don't 
really know how I would benefit from becoming a republic. But that being said, I don't have a particular opinion on the matter about whether we should or shouldn't. Gordian, how about you, Senior Australian of the Year? Is it a subject you want to buy into or just steer away from? Very simply, I think what everybody's saying, forgive me, uh, is that we really want to be... Australia is for Australians. And one of the things uh, I am conscious of, not that I think a flag is everything, but I'd like to see us all under one flag. New Zealand has got changing their flag, whatever. I'm not saying we should change the flag, but I think it's sad that we have three flags whenever there's an official occasion. We should have one flag, one Australia for all Australians. Stan, what do you think? About the, the issue of a republic? Personally, I, I'm... Well, I'm... and also, actually, you could start with what the questioner put, which is, is it right for mm. uh, an Australian of the Year to raise this issue? I think, it's abs I think it's right for an Australian of the Year to use that position to advocate or to raise issues that he or she thinks need to be raised. As David has said, in a respectful way, I would equally accept if someone was Australian of the Year and they wanted to advocate for a constitutional monarchy, it would That's be right. their right. Yep. Uh, I'm in favour of a republic, but like many people who are Republicans, unsure of what the model would be. Do we have a direct election model? If we have a direct election, does that person then have a political mandate above our parliament? Do we have our parliamentarians nominate someone? Is it a minimalist model which changes the Governor-General's title to a, a president title? In that case, do we allow our parliamentarians that? And what about our input into that? Stan, I, I, I think there are lots uh, of... Uh, uh, there was we, a... we, are, we do have a point of view here. Th there was an article in uh, The Weekend Australian written by Chris Kenny, and, and he, he had a... Uh, you know, he was critical of what I, I said, but I can say to you, Chris, that I thought it was an excellent article uh, because he spoke to the need for the detail mm. rather than it to be... Not just a plebiscite. Absolutely. Yeah. The detail. And I think that it, it is on uh, the Australian Republican movement, and I know that they are starting to, to look at this, to actually uh, have the, a, de a more detailed conversation. What would a model look like? I mean, we are a long way off here. Do you have a model that you favour? No. no. Well, I do, but I wouldn't share it with you, and I don't think it would be appropriate to do so because this is a national conversation. Yeah, but in and a national uh, conversation, uh, you no, actually no. have to have a few I've facts already, on the table. I've, I've already <laughs> declared, I've already declared uh, my broad view and... I'm leaving it for everybody else to either have a conversation or not. And if people don't want it, well, I'll just shut up. Can't imagine President Morrison at some oh, point. <laughs> no, I okay. guarantee you that that will never happen. Uh, there's a, a related question, actually. This time for one last question. It's from Tom Gersbach. Oh, thank you, Tony. I'd like to ask Stan Grant, um, uh, what do you think of Noel Pearson's uh, regret that he didn't enter politics some years ago? And, um, and given that, um, would you consider entering, um, um, seeking election in the federal parliament? This is meant to be a politician free night. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, let, let me be, be honest with you. The response to the speech that I had, that I, that I gave, I found so overwhelming and, and overwhelmingly positive that the messages that I tried to send in that speech, I think, have been well received and, to be honest, it bewi bewildered me um, in the first few days. The ground sort of shifted beneath my feet. If you ask, do, what do I do with that? Um, clearly there is a responsibility and obligation to the words of that speech. And this is not a political answer, by the way. I'm not trying to be a politician before my time. But yes, I, I, I would consider something is that in my thoughts? Yes, it is in my thoughts. Federal politics? It, it, it is in my thoughts, but I don't... But it is just a thought. Stan, federal politics? Federal <laughs> politics, potentially advocacy, um, potentially staying in the media and, and, and continuing to do what I do. In some way, having an obligation to the words and honouring the words of that speech. This is a great country and my people still suffer in this country, and if I can make a contribution to that, then I think it behooves me to do that. But at this stage, there's no flesh on the bone. I'm not saying I'm entering federal politics or I'm going to... You might get a few phone calls because... tomorrow. Yeah, well, yeah. That's all I'm saying. But would would I get any votes is the real question. <laughs> well, I suppose that's what the political parties will be asking. But, but, but do you have a particular one that you would favour? Is there... No, no, no. no, 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 no. 
let me say quite, quite honestly, I, I'm a very pragmatic guy. You know, I'm not ideologically driven. Um, I do think that the Indigenous issue is a national project. Mm. And I think it, it is beyond partisan politics. Every single time we open Parliament, we open it with an Indigenous welcome to country and we disappear. It has taken over 100 years since Federation to put an Indigenous person on the front bench of either major party in Ken Wyatt. There are, you know, we are so underrepresented. And Noel's right. If you want to make a change, you need to get in and make okay, a change. But does that fall to me at the age I'm of 52 not, not saying... to suddenly put my hand up and embark on a political career? That's another question. I'm not saying that was a stump speech, but no. it <laughs> sounded a bit like one. Uh, Catherine, what... What do you think about the prospect? That's of... <laughs> yeah. What do you think about the prospect of politics? I mean, you've got a brother who's in politics. Oh, for me? Oh mm, God, yeah. no. Um, no, absolutely not. Under any circumstances, I have an absolutely yeah. fantastic job. I wouldn't change that for the world. You, you don't see politics as a place from which to change the world. Oh, look, I, I do, I do, but you have to, you have to be a person who wants to change it in that way. There are many ways to change the world, and politics is only one of them. David. I, I would never stand for elected office, ever. Is this because of the amount of respect you have for politicians? I do have a lot of, res <laughs> I, I do have a lot of respect for politicians. I, I've worked closely with uh, successive uh, you know, defence ministers on both sides of politics uh, as a so senior So why wouldn't officer. you do it? You seem quite good at speaking to an audience. Uh, no. I, I mean, I, I've seen what politicians have to do and, and I think we, we as a nation are, are pretty hard on our, our politicians. Yeah. They do an enormous amount of work and it's a hard grind. It's not for me and I'll never stand. Uh, Gordian, I'm sure what you're going to say uh, is, no, don't be silly, but maybe you're not. I think, first of all, uh, we should be grateful that we've got a democracy because there's no better system. And the other thing is I'm so lucky where I work with whom I work with because we can treat everybody equally. Australia has got, when you come to an emergency department, you don't get charged. We can do all the tests and look after you and each one is same and that's brilliant. So I've spent a lucky life being able to treat people equally. As no, a politician, oh, sorry, sorry, no, no, I, I thought you'd stop going. Sorry. As a politician, by definition, you have to try and curry favour for votes and you have to pay off factions. I have met politicians. That's a hell of a life. Uh, <laughs> Manal, uh, is there room for uh, a Muslim slam poet um, in politics? I'm not sure, we'll have to see, but I don't think that it'll be me who's testing that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I completely agree with, um, with Kath that it's something that, you know, you've got to decide your role, how you want to change, how you want to make change, and I don't think politics is Don't we is need more way. women in politics? We, Isn't that part of the argument? We definitely do, and I would definitely fight for that and try to help create those opportunities, but it's just not my You're place. You're not going to put your hand up? No. Well, that's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Stan Grant, Catherine Keenan, David Morrison, Manal Yunus, Gordian Fulda. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And before we go, we'd like to mention the passing of Anna Lamaro, who appeared on the Q&A panel in November to discuss the prospect of facing death. Uh, very sadly, she died peacefully in January. Now, next Monday, Q&A will broadcast from Melbourne with leading Melbourne broadcaster Neil Mitchell. The Minister for Rural Health, Fiona Nash, the Shadow Minister for Health, uh, Catherine King, Industrial Relations Commentator, Grace Collier, and the Secretary of the Australian Council of Trade Unions, Dave Oliver. Until next week's Q&A, good night. <laughs>